Hey, I'm going to encourage you to dare to be different. If, and, you know, maybe you already are management tends to grace you, but there's other things that maybe you need to be working on. I'm going to say dare to be a hurt quitter. This room's full of hurt quitters. What's my definition of a hurt quitter? A hurt quitter is someone who has enough courage to break away from the status quo, hurt mentality way of thinking. It all starts up here. People, for the most part, are a part of peer groups. And we're affected by peer pressure. How many of you started your rotational grazing or management intensive grazing and the neighbors started talking about you? And for, you know, they were making fun of you. They, that won't work. I mean, that's, that's peer pressure. You know, you're making them uncomfortable, so they're going to start making fun of you. We have got to have enough courage to break away from that way of thinking. Profit equals income minus expenses. In other words, my profit equals what I produce times its market value minus my expenses. In agriculture, we have very little control over the market or the prices we receive. That's our weak point. Most farmers and ranchers are in the commodity business. We produce a commodity, we haul it to town, and we sell it for what someone else is willing to pay us on that particular day. What control do we have over this transaction? The marketing. But the only thing we control is what? No, over the marketing part. What day do we take it to town? Some years we're going to look really smart, and some years we don't look so smart. We're at the mercy of the market. Commodity business, by definition, is a break-even business. That's another kind of depressing statement, but it's true. And the sooner we recognize that as being a truth, the sooner we can adapt and change and do what needs to be done to, break, to, be, to be profitable. What can we do to increase our profit potential? Now we can spend the rest of the afternoon talking about this. I'm going to give two simple answers to this question. Number one, get out of the commodity business and sell a product. In other words, instead of selling the same commodity that all of our neighbors are doing, we can sell a product like grass-finished beef directly to the end consumer. Now I have control over my market and my prices. I produce a product, I tell the housewife how good my product is, why it's good, I tell her what the cost is, and she can take it or leave it. The cattle cycle kind of goes up and down. You know, calf, calf prices will be up here and then they'll go down here. It used to be kind of a 10 year cycle, 10 years from top to top, 10 years from bottom to bottom. We broke that cycle. We've been up here at the top for about 12 years now. And it's making ranchers, farmers and ranchers complacent. But whenever, the last time we were at the bottom of the cycle was 19, the mid-1990s. And some of you were in the business in the mid-1990s. When we were receiving very low prices for our calves, what was going on in the grocery store? How, what, what happened to the price of beef in the grocery store? Stayed right there. Stayed the same had no, no impact. I mean, it may have gone down, may have gone up, but basically it was not affected by what we were doing on the ranch. Why? Because they were selling a product. And that's what we can do. We can insulate ourselves from the cattle cycle. I know that there are a whole bunch of people in this room that are probably selling a product instead of a commodity. Uh, raise of hand. How many of you believe you're selling a product instead of a commodity? Okay? I can't, you, you put your hands down too quick. Somebody put your hand back up. I'm going to pick on this guy right back here. Is that a green cap you have on? What do you sell? Grass finished beef. Grass finished beef. And lamb. Uh, how long have you been doing it? Uh, 10 years. 10 years. Is it easy? No. Hey, real quick, he said no. If it was easy, everyone would be doing it. It's not easy. It requires a whole lot more thinking and planning, management, and something called marketing. How many of you like marketing? 
You're, you're the only contrarian in this whole audience, right? I do. I like to visit. <laughs> no kidding. <laughs> it's not that easy, but it can be done. And as far as marketing goes, when you have a product that you firmly believe in and you're passionate about it, it'll market itself. You can't help it. I can't help it. But not everybody's going to do it. The other way we can increase our profit potential is to increase our production and or, and or reduce our expenses. If we are going to stay in the commodity business, and most people will, I'm not saying most of you will, but most people will, we must, we must be better than average in one or both of these areas. Now why do I say we must be better than average? Average is what? Break even. Break even. Average is break even. So we're going to have to figure out how to be better than average or we're, we're just breaking even. What's the first thing that most farmers and ranchers do to try to increase their profits? And that includes you and me. I mean, maybe we're smarter now, but what's the first thing that everybody does to try to in increase their profits? Increase production. Increase production. Almost without exception. You know, I'm not making any money with 100 cows. Let's see what I can do with 200 cows. Uh, maybe I can make it up in volume. Does that work? No. No. But I'm here to tell you, and I know most of you already know this, we can increase our profits just as easy by increasing or by reducing and eliminating our expenses. What happens when we increase our production? Expenses. Expenses go up. Took us a long time to figure that one out, didn't it? Every time I increase my production, I increase my expenses. For example, any time I add 50 pounds to my weaning weight, there, there's a cost involved. You don't get 50 pounds of beef for nothing. There's no free lunches in this business. <clears throat> Every increase comes with cost. Every farm or ranch that I know of is either production driven or profit driven. In other words, management decisions are either based upon increasing their production or upon increasing their profits. Guess what most farmers and ranchers are? Production driven. For the last 60 years probably, we've been programmed to think in terms of bushels per acre, tons per acre, and pounds per calf. You know, I've talked to two or three people here today that said, you know, I like big calves. I'm going to do whatever it takes to get big calves. That's a production-driven individual. What we need to be concerned about is profit per acre. Not per calf, not per cow, not per whatever, but per acre. We have a certain amount of land that we're in control of. Whether we own it or lease it or whatever, it's collecting solar energy and that's our, that's our factory. Can we increase the profit we, we, that, that land generates? Production and profit are not the same thing. We've been misled for 40 years. All you've got to do is increase your production, you're going to be more profitable. Doesn't work that way, does it? At one time, maybe it did. We increased our weaning weights or whatever and we start to make a little bit more money. Eventually you reach the point of diminishing returns and it starts going the other way. And yet we just keep going because we can't turn our thinking around. Let's look at the difference between an average producer and a low input producer. This black wavy line here, that represents a cattle cycle I mentioned a little bit ago. As I said, for most of my lifetime, from peak to peak is about 9 to 11 years, from bottom to bottom about 9 to 11 years. We have been near the top for the last 12 plus years. What's going to happen when calf prices eventually do come down? How many people are getting filthy rich up here at the top right now? Not many. Not many. And so that, that's why, you know, I think this type of information is critical. We need to start thinking, you know, what, what are we going to do? Look at the average producer. This red line here represents an average producer. 
He's making money here, he's losing money here. He's a break-even producer. How in the world can this guy stay in business? Not only is he staying in business, he's the second or third or fourth generation on that same farm that's doing that. How's he doing? How, the, how can they do that? Equity. Equity? Borrow against it, so it gets good and paid off. Okay. What what are some other answers? <laughs> Subsidy. Subsidies. Subsidized by what? His wife's working in town. <laughs> and that's a good one. You know, uh, again, the reason we laugh at these things is because it's true. Many of you have wives working in town. Many of you are working in town yourself. That's subsidizing the farm or the ranch. So we can subsidize the farm or the ranch with government payments. Those who happen to have an oil well lost in their backyard, that's subsidizing them. The other thing that I think is happening here is that this individual, is, he's a tough individual. He's not, he's afraid of failure. He knows that when he's making money, he can't spend it all on new pickups. But he will buy a new pickup, I guarantee you. He's going to put some of it in the bank so that when he gets down here, he's got a little bit of a buffer zone. That works, but we're still break even, aren't we? The other thing that happens down here is we know that bottom's not going to last forever. We just tighten up our belt and we grit our teeth and we just hang on. So we go year after year, generation after generation in a break-even business. This blue line here represents a low input producer. Now this guy, even on the worst years, is still making a little bit of money. On the best years, he's making so much he can't buy any, enough new pickups. There are guys ranching on this ranch, this, this line. Uh, <clears throat> as we kind of mentioned earlier, I don't want to get personal here. I don't want to talk about you, but I don't mind talking about your neighbors. I'll bet you don't mind talking about your neighbors either. What percent of your neighbors, Greg, are ranching on this line? None. What percent of your neighbors are ranching on this line? None? We're in Missouri, folks. There's got to be somebody ranching on this line that you live next to. Ron? What do you think? <laughs> you knew that guy. Okay, let me ask you this question. What percent of people in Missouri are farming or ranching on this line? What do you think? 3%. 3 percent? 3%? 1 percent? They're around, but they've used it on real points in their life, and they figured it out. Yeah. Well, that's okay. I, I, I'm going to say that uh, it's probably... I'm going to be generous and say probably in Missouri it, it may be closer to 10 percent. I'm going to be a little bit more optimistic than you. This, this state is probably more progressive in that area than any other state I've been in. Would that be fair to say in that, Jim Garrish? This state. This state. It's one of the leaders. One of the leaders. Maybe 12, 15 percent. I said 10. Do you think 15? I'm more optimistic in Missouri than I was in other places where I was not in Yeah. Okay. Yeah, when we were in Idaho, I asked Jim then, I think he was 5% or less. And that's probably true in Idaho. But there are people ranching, farming on this line. The most profitable ranchers, farmers that I know of, all have one thing in common, and they're striving to make the most efficient use of the forage resources on their farm or ranch. <laughs> Basically, they're taking what solar energy falls on that land and using it to its fullest, almost without exception. To do this requires what I call the three keys, planned rotational grazing, management intensive grazing, whatever you want to call it, matching your production cycle to your forage resources, and matching cow size and type to your forage resources. I'm going to very, very briefly talk about these first two, and then we're going to spend the rest of the day or afternoon talking about the last one. 
planned rotational grazing. We started our, our grazing system in the summer of 1994 